Yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, thank you very much for joining today's call. Um, in a minute, I'll introduce you to my co-hosts. But first, I wanted to say how excited we are for the turnouts that we've been getting for these uh, parent workshops. Um, if you remember before the pandemic, we used to have parent workshops in person on issues about screen time and social media and other topics like uh, you, YouTube, video games, um, and mentoring kids to make good decisions online. And although there's a lot to be said for the kinds of interactions that are possible when we're face-to-face -face in a classroom together, uh, the total number of parents who are participating these days in our 2030 series and our Mustang Connections and these KVC parent workshops, it's really high. And I'm glad that conducting these over Zoom is making the content more accessible and it's uh, perhaps more convenient for parents and it's uh, we're able to get more people to participate. Um, and I know a lot of you attended our screen time and sleep workshop in October or the workshop on stress management in November. Um, and I love that the recordings that we share on YouTube, on our YouTube channel afterwards, uh, get so many viewers. Um, so if you aren't able to attend, you can watch the recording and also you can download the handouts and see the links to the podcasts and videos. And you can watch it uh, uh, at 150% if you want to get through it faster, which is nice too. Um, but I am excited to say that our next in, uh, parent workshop we're planning to be in person, and that's going to be in May, uh, a workshop about media literacy, sexting, and online pornography. And that's going to be live at the ELC on May 15th. And these are all part of what we're calling our No Value Care Parent Partnership Workshops. Uh, which are more than just presentations or conversations, um, because there's always going to be a place for a virtual town hall or a one-way information webinar. But for topics like tackling the challenges of parenting in the modern world or being aware of our emotional state when we engage with social media, or preventing substance abuse, we want more than just an informational webinar. What we really want is a true learning partnership. So in a regular class at ASIJ, teachers actively create learning partnerships that deepen the learning in their curriculum. And those might be with students in other classes or grades or at other schools or with parents or experts or other community members. Um, and this parent partnership today is another example of that sort of relationship where we want to connect parents at ASIJ with the tools and the resources, the experts and the understanding that help us all make sure that our students, your children can navigate these difficult social and emotional challenges that they're facing today. Because whether you are a parent or a teacher or the director of technology, we all want our kids to be healthy and happy, and we want them to make good choices even when there aren't any adults around. Um, and we're always planning more No Value Care Parent Partnerships to connect parents with our technology team and outside experts and counselors and each other. Um, and so we really, uh, we would like you to help us by suggesting topics. Uh, we're always trying to make these as relevant as possible. So at the end of today's session, we'll share a link to a survey that will help you help us improve and also let us know what topics you want to see covered. Um, today's workshop is on social media. It is a complex topic. It changes all the time. And I think that we're going to learn a lot uh, today. Um, and so now I'd like to introduce you to today's hosts. I'm Warren Appel. I'm the Director of Technology at ASIJ. Hi, I'm Josh Robb. I'm a Director of IT Services at ASIJ. I'm also a parent. I have a high schooler and a middle schooler. Hi, I'm Randy Wilkinson. I'm the Elementary Curriculum Coordinator. I also am a parent and I have um, an eighth grader and a ninth grader. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Nadine Dickinson. I'm the Middle School High School Curriculum Coordinator here. I'm also a parent. I have two children, uh, teenagers, both 19 and 17. Okay, so today's um, big idea around social media is that we can mentor our children through ongoing conversations so that they learn how to make intentional choices when using social media. So we want you to know that this is an ongoing process and the, the content of your conversations, as well as how you approach um, encouraging them to continue talking to you is going to look different at each stage as they grow. But what remains the same is that we want to um, maintain our mentor stance so that they continue talking to us and we can continue teaching them how to make intentional choices. So as we start to unpack that big idea, the first thing we need to do is have an understanding of what social media is. Um, you know, when we say social media, the first thing that often comes to mind are apps like Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, which are all social media. But we want to expand that definition a little bit more to include any technology that allows us to connect with others. And the reason for that is that 
um, our children at all different ages are also engaging in other things like maybe FaceTiming relatives back home, doing Google chat with classmates, um, talking to uh, other people they're playing games with within uh, Minecraft. And so there are lots of different ways that our children are engaging with others that goes beyond just sort of the typical, what we think of as social media apps. And so by opening up that definition, we, we are also acknowledging that the strategies we're going to talk to and talk about today actually apply to a wide variety of interactions that our children are, ha are having. And so keep that in mind as we talk about social media today, that it's encompassing all ways that, that students connect with others online. And that's actually the context we approach as we talk with students about social media at ASIJ. Yeah, so our intentional skill building here at ASIJ that directly relates or is about social media starts in the elementary school when um, in our English language arts curriculum, actually, we're learning about author's intent and how do we understand that? How do we understand their perspective and what they're trying to get us to um, understand or persuade us to believe. Um, again, techniques of opinion and persuasive writing. So that's both how you do it and how to recognize when others are trying to persuade you. Um, persuading you using ethos, pathos, and logos and how that's effective. Um, also how you can be aware of that when that's happening to you. Of course, research skills, um, finding credible resources, and then messaging etiquette. What's not listed here is um, some of our SEL learning, so social emotional learning, because a big part of posting online is for kids and, and adults really to start being aware and curious about the feelings that they get when something happens. So that emotional reaction first is what we need to be aware of. So that's embedded in our um, social emotional learning curriculum. And uh, in middle school, uh the the skill building happens largely through the advisory program uh, in every grade level in middle school six seven and eight there is a unit with a focus on digital citizenship and uh, some of the things that are addressed are um, instilling in students the importance of honesty and integrity obviously in in life but definitely online as well um, and sometimes there's that temptation to present yourself a little bit differently in an online setting. And so there's conversations around that, teaching them decision making skills. And then, as Randy mentioned, the idea of social awareness. Um, so that happens largely through advisory program in middle school. Um, in high school, we continue with the advisory program to teach uh, these skills that are needed. And it really sort of goes from digital citizenship to more digital leadership. Uh, there's a big emphasis on communicating respectfully online and building that empathy and understanding the impact that their um, participation in social media has on others and what that might look like, as well as determining what's true. And that goes back to uh, the research skills and, and not only identifying credible sources, um, but building on that understanding of what, what is real, what is true and distinguishing between what happens online uh, and what happens in real life. Um, this also happens in curricular classes too, predominantly I would say English and humanities classes um, that uh, these topics come up and they're addressed by the teacher and, uh, and relevant to the students in their conversations and what they're studying, so. Uh, we gave you a homework assignment, um, so hopefully when you registered for the webinar, it asked you to do a homework assignment. Uh, we wanted you to have a conversation with your child to find out what their favorite use of social media is. And so if you could um, open up the chat function in Zoom and just take a second to jot down in the chat uh, what your child's favorite social media is, um, what apps or platforms are popular with their friends? Uh, what do they make? What are they spending the most time on? And and even if you didn't have a chance to talk to them, maybe you know from just uh, observing them what sort of social media they're using these days. So let's just take a second to to post that into the chat so we we kind of know which social media tools your kids are using. All right, as I expected, I would have said Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok. Those are the ones that I see the kids using. So it's yeah, Instagram, popular one. 
great minecraft which is as josh said uh, minecraft and roblox are types of social media all right imessage and youtube we also wanted to know how does social media make them feel uh, when they're using it does it bring them joy does it make them laugh or does it make them feel sad or left out or jealous so what do you notice when your kids are using social media does do you does it seem like they're happy when they use it does it seem like it makes them uh sad and withdrawn or connected to their friends also there's one that's not visible to everybody but says um obsessed and yes i, I can he can confirm with that as well also kids can get into it that is true so when we talk about um how social media makes us feel one of the healthy habits that children and adults alike can work on is just to be aware of our emotions so this is a through line in guidance classes and advisory lessons almost in every grade level um, when you uh, pick up your phone and click on Instagram, does it make you happy? Does it bring you joy? Are you doing it because you love to see photos of your friends and of cute cats? Or when you use it, does it make you feel sad? Are you seeing other people have fun and it makes you feel like you're missing out? Um, because if you're aware of this, then you can realize that if using social media makes us sad, we should do it less often. Uh, but in order to make that call and to be intentional, we really have to be in touch with our emotions. Um, and sometimes all of us uh, uh, lose track of time, right? We're we're doom scrolling on Twitter or, or on Instagram. We're just scrolling through it. Um, and, and when that happens, we need to build a habit to snap ourselves out of it and think, hey, is this bringing me joy right now? Because if it isn't, we need to put it down. Um, and... Um, and I'm, I'm glad that so many of you have had uh, conversations with your child about this. Um, uh, I wanted to share a little bit. There's been some really good research lately about the causal effects of social media on our emotional health. Uh, up until recently, most research has been correlations. Um, and so uh, now we're starting to understand more about exactly what's happening. And in, in the links later, I'm going to share some, some of the original research and also a podcast that discusses it. Um, essentially, the, the connection between social media use and depression or anxiety stem from the psychological problem where we're not keeping in mind that what people post online isn't really who they are all the time. We see other people having fun and going on vacations, and so we compare ourselves negatively to them, which can make us feel sad. Um, and what we have to remember, which is sometimes hard, is that this curated persona we see other people do isn't really their reality. Um, uh, and, and that's just kind of something that we can help uh, young people remember. Um, and then this is a fact that I find really interesting, too. Um, when people use social media, they tend to overestimate the amount of alcohol that other people consume. Uh, it's normal to see pictures of people at parties drinking or toasting champagne. And we reach the conclusion that most people are drinking alcohol most of the time, which is not only incorrect, it's a really bad conclusion for young people to draw because that normalizes excessive alcohol consumption. Um, so it's really important that we work together to help keep young people keep it all in perspective, especially if you notice that their use of social media is tending to make them unhappy. So when you have conversations with your um, with your children about how they're using social media, um, maybe it's in a little bit of an awkward conversation. Maybe it doesn't feel quite natural to be asking them about their their use of social media and they might resist the conversation initially. But the important thing is to uh, continue being curious and to continue asking questions about their use of social media, about their use of technology, because it opens the door. And when that door is open, it acts as a protective factor. And it means that if your child gets themselves into a sticky situation or something that makes them feel uncomfortable or upset to do with social media, then they're more likely to approach you um, for help. And that is the key. Um, in previous sessions, we've talked about these different modes of parenting limiting, enabling, and mentoring. Uh, so an example might be of a limiting action where you have your high school daughter and you um, feel that you are well-informed and that you have um, kept up to date with things and you find out that um, you can have a negative impact on her body image. And the recent evidence around Instagram shows that 
uh, there's a connection there. So you think you're being proactive and helping her, uh, helping to protect her from this by asking her to delete her Instagram account. The problem with this is that your daughter might be something of a social media influencer on Instagram, and she takes pride in that uh, persona and in her followers. And so asking her to delete the app is very unfair. So what would she do instead? She might delete the app, but then she might start a new account under a different name that you don't know about. And that sets up a dynamic of secrecy around her social media use and therefore closes that door. Um, so can you imagine instead of what it might look like to actually have a conversation with her about what you've read, uh, the connection between body image and images seen on uh, social media like Instagram? Maybe as an influencer, she takes that in and she uses her platform to advocate for awareness and she shares her posts with you and the conversation grows. Um, another example of an enabling an, um, action with younger age children might be as a parent, your elementary age child asks for an Instagram account with the wine that, but everybody in my grade has one. Um, an enabling action would be just to accept that as true and then give them permission to use the app because you don't want them to feel like they're missing out on a social aspect of life with their friends that they're all supposedly using. What happens instead if you imagine a conversation where you talk to your child about what they can and can't do, why, when, and together you decide when ready would be. Is it legal age of 13? Is it once they've demonstrated that they can use social media safely with things like Google messages? Uh, and it also adds to the fact that, that everybody else is doing it is not going to work. But you get the idea, you get the picture. There's a well-used analogy about how we would never hand our children the keys to the car and expect them to drive off on their own without any support. And the same is true of technology. We have to teach and mentor, we have to guide, we have to expect that sometimes they're going to have bumps and we need to redirect and recorrect. Um, but if that is uh, in conversation with you as the parent and you are mentoring that, then the door will be open and eventually you're going to feel comfortable riding in the passenger seat. I love that car analogy because, you know, part of that also is that we don't say, you never get to drive the car. We say, we're going to help you learn how to drive the car. And, and part of us teaching a, a child how to drive the car is, is modeling, you know, they're watching us drive the car. And the same thing is true with our usage of social media. Uh, we are using it as well, most of us, and our children are watching that as well. So always think about that as we talk today. A lot of this can apply to us as well, especially this next topic, which is the difference between passive and active uses of social media. And so, you know, when we think about our children using social media, um, whether it is chatting within Minecraft versus on Instagram, we need to sort of think about what, what is the purpose? Why are they doing that? And oftentimes it comes down to needing and wanting social interaction. And that's something that's become even more important in the last couple of years where a lot of children have felt isolated because of the pandemic. Um, there's a way they could reach out still through these other, these other means. You know, and so we, we know that there's balance and balance is important. And we know balancing between face-to-face -face interaction and interaction through a device is one, one bit. You know, we talk about a balances of outdoor and indoor play. This is something as parents that we think about often. But there's another thing to think about, and that's the balance between passive and active use of social media. And um, what that really means is that you're going to be thinking about, okay, Passive use is something that is like watching videos, scrolling through YouTube, letting TikTok just tell you what videos to watch. You're not making choices. The videos are just being shown to you and your brain is in a passive mode. It's, it's, it's akin to flipping through channels in, in, on a television, right? You see this a lot in Facebook and TikTok. And, and this is something that, that, yes, you can post to those things, but oftentimes most people are just letting it wash over them. Active is a little bit different. Active usage is you're posting, you're commenting, you're engaging with others. It uses a different part of your brain. Um, you can see this with different uh, messages with friends. 
Discord is another type of social media that a lot of uh, young people use where there are servers made around specific topics. So if a topic you're interested in, you might go in there and interact with others. Um, and, and what's nice about this analogy or this, this dichotomy is that you can start to think about, okay, it's, it's choices you make, not only in using social media or not, but what types of social media you spend your time on. And, and what that can be akin to is, is social snacking, or, or if you think about it nutritionally. Um, there's a researcher, uh, Natalie Pennington out of UNLV, that talks about um, when you're hungry, you wanna have a snack, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with needing a snack. Sometimes you just need to get a quick fill of something. That's great, and you can, have that snack, but nobody would think that you can only live on snacks. If you're only eating junk food and candy, you're going to get sick. You don't get that nutrition. And when you're thinking about social media, things like YouTube, things like TikTok, where you're just sitting and absorbing, those are snacks. They're fine in, in moderation, but you need to balance that out with a new, more nutritional social media media menu where you are engaging and interacting with others as well. And I think the other thing to kind of point out is that, you know, we often sort of think about this as like a doom and gloom, but, but the good news is it's not all doom and gloom. Um, there are a lot of studies um, that also show that social media uh, effect on, on young people, they, they self-report that uh, about 50% say that they actually feel better using social media and only 10% feel worse. But what you need to do is to understand that part of that uh, feeling better and feeling worse is also dependent, as Warren said, on your, your child's sort of predisposition to see things in certain ways, what kind of social media they use. It's a big umbrella. And so I think going back to that mentoring view, if you're thinking about having conversations and having conversations with your children about social media and usage, the passive versus active is a great way to have that conversation and to talk about as you're exploring how it's making them feel. Also, you can talk about what choices they are making in terms of passive use versus active use. And when when our kids are making those choices, when they're using social media, um, when when kids or adults, we really should be aware of the algorithm. Uh, uh, algorithm is a technical term, but it's just a, it's a set of rules that determine what video or post you see next. Uh, so we kind of need to ask who wrote the algorithm and what are its goals? Because we don't always know, uh, but we can, we can guess for most social media platforms, keeping you using the app as much time as possible is really a big, um, a big goal of the algorithm. Um, and if we're just passive, then the algorithm chooses for us. Um, but if you really want to affect what the algorithm gives us, we do have some effect if we're being active in our usage. So thinking about intentionally what we choose to like, what we choose to watch, who we choose to follow will have an impact on what the algorithm shows us and will help us, it will, it will help make sure that the content that we get is what we really want to get. The more active we are and the more choices we make, the more control we have over what we see online. Um, and a good way to be active is to actually post to social media. Yes, posting and interacting um, with awareness and intentionality back to the um, sort of main idea of this, um, this KBC talk here. Um, so first, there's like two sides to this coin. So that's why this slide is sort of divided into two. So first with your um, pausing and thinking before you post, thinking about will this post, this comment, or this message have a negative impact on the situation or my reputation or someone else's reputation? And then am I sharing, commenting, or messaging in a way that I will regret later? So again, that's the awareness of how you're feeling before you post intentionally. Um, and then on the other side of it, um, thinking about the post, and this is a way you can continue to get curious about it, um, thinking why did they post this? What was their intention? How do you think they were feeling? Were they trying to um, persuade you, or inform you, or entertain you? And then um, always, how is this platform trying to make money on you, and how does this affect you? These are some good questions that you can use um, when you're mentor parenting and talking through it. Um, something that I did kind of going back a couple of slides with um, with my daughter when she wanted Instagram and I thought it was too early as we opened one together. And so then when messages came up, we always talked out loud about it and 
and I could help show her when she was starting to um, compare herself to others or when things would upset her. Because one of the challenges with social media um, is that it makes it really easy to quickly post. And our young people, their brains aren't developed all the way. So it's really easy um, not to pause and think. So important mentor strategy to get them to slow down, think about their intentions, think about the post, um, the post intention um, as you teach them to drive that car. So let's just think about the adolescent brain for a moment in particular. What neuroscience tells us is that the brain continues to develop into teenagehood and then into the 20s and even 30s, according to some scientists, which is great news for us as parents and as educators, because we know that brain development means opportunities then for learning. So we're just going to take a minute and watch this short video from UNICEF. We used to think the shaping of brain wiring systems tapered off after early childhood. But neuroscience tells us the brain goes through another rapid phase of change from age 9 to 14, a second window of opportunity. Early adolescence is a crucial period for brain development where many challenges begin to emerge. It is also a time of opportunity when rapid changes can be harnessed to set adolescence on a positive path. Puberty initiates intense hormonal changes when the brain is forming better and faster connections between systems, improving the ability to make decisions, solve problems, understand consequences, and to gain more control over emotions and behavior. At the same time, the adolescent brain goes through a period of greater sensitivity to social evaluation and emotional reactions, Increased sensation seeking, interest in social relationships, and exploration of identity all begin to emerge. Early adolescence brings on broadening experiences, acquisition of new skills, and formation of social networks that will have lasting impacts for the rest of a young person's life. To learn more, download the new publication, The Adolescent Brain, a second window of opportunity on the link below. So that video um, talk specifically about ages 9 to 14, but we do know that the pathways are still being formed um, well beyond that as well. And our tweens and teens, they are making decisions every day, every hour, every minute about their interaction on social media. And um, if we think of those times as windows of opportunity, so ripe for learning, then we see how important it is that we stay part of our children's tech life and online life all the way through high school. There is a story out there about a senior from several years ago who was accepted to Harvard. Um, and then in the course of that, he met virtually online with others who were also going to join him in Harvard that fall. Uh, he posted some in inappropriate content, some inappropriate memes that actually went viral, and then ultimately he had his acceptance letter rescinded. He ended up having to take a year off, um, attended a different university, but did rebound to share the story as a cautionary tale. So the point is that teens still need guidance, and we need to keep that door open for them um, to approach us when needed. Yeah, something that I know um, my own teenagers are struggling with um, right now is as they are creating their own identity um, and examining you know, the values that they have from being a part of our family, um, as they're scrolling and as they're seeing content that others are putting up, they're constantly kind of um, evaluating and measuring and comparing who they are against who they're seeing. And of course, they're seeing a highlight reel oftentimes. Um, so again, when we're, sorry, when kids are sort of scrolling through all these things and they get into this high arousal emotional state, as scientists call it, um, they're just more apt to make negative choices, whether that's reacting and feeling bad about themselves because they aren't as great as what they're seeing online or something that's more scary, like um, a, a chain letter in elementary school to the tune of, 
if you don't send this to 10 of your friends, you will die in your sleep or have seven years bad luck. Um, it could be, you know, a crazy rumor um, where they hear something and they immediately pass it on before they even think about it. Um, it could be an unbelievable news story. Um, it could be a product that they just must have. They, they watch it for two seconds and they're hooked. It will definitely clear their teenage acne. <laughs> that happened last night in our house. Um, things like that. And the key again is to pause and get curious, curious about what you're feeling, curious about the author's intent, um, curious about if it is aligning to your own values. And if you repost it or react and even tell someone, um, you know, verbally when you see them that, at school, is that making the situation better? Is that aligning to the values that you know you have and that you treasure? Um, again, these conversations as a mentor parent, you want to keep these doors open. It's not um, in judgment. It's um, it's thinking through it with them. And one of the ways you can always do this is to talk out loud as you're scrolling your Instagram. Um, hopefully they're around and you can talk about what you're seeing and what you're feeling and what you might do because of those feelings. Yeah, and um, and this kind of being in touch with your feelings, this is the same effect, uh, this emotional effect. When my dad sees a Facebook post that says something like Bill Clinton admits in an interview that he is a murderer, he gets really outraged. And I'm never 100% sure if he's mad because he knows that it's fake and he's mad at other people for posting it, or if he's actually mad at Clinton for murdering people. But I know from seeing my dad's actions on Facebook that what he needs to do is to take a second and think about his emotions before he posts stuff on Facebook. I think we all need to do that. Um, uh, when we're in a heightened emotional state, we don't react rationally. Um, and the authors of the content that are on social media are counting on that. It doesn't matter to them why you're reacting. You're amplifying their message. And it doesn't matter how old we are. We all need to be aware of our emotions. And when our emotions are too amped up, we need to stop posting until we calm down. Um, one of the articles that I'm going to share with you later is the first chapter of Tim Harford's book, The Data, Detect the Data Detective. Um, his book and his podcast, Cautionary Tales, are both really good and worth reading. And, and this is one of the one of the quotes I really like about emotions. Um, we shouldn't try to make our emotions vanish, nor should we want to, but we can and should try to notice when they're clouding our judgment. Um, and then uh, this is really an important uh part of the social media conversation is to really understand what the rules are. Um, I, I want to tell you about three different sorts of rules. Um, one sort of rules are the non-negotiables, and this doesn't matter how old your child is. There are prosecutable offenses, so never impersonate someone else on social media. Um, and it might be really easy, and, and it is really easy, to take a photo of the principal and make a fake Instagram account with their name and their photo and then post funny stories on it. But that is actually illegal identity theft, and it's not a practical joke. It's really taken seriously. Um, and then also nude photos. We'll, we'll talk more about this in our next session on sexting. But as soon as your child is old enough to use a camera, you really need to reinforce this concept. Never, ever take pictures of yourself or anyone else without their clothes on. Um, and don't ask anybody else for naked pictures of themselves. Um, and if somebody asks you, don't send them. Uh, I think of this a little bit like running with scissors. My mom, when I was a kid, told me so many times not to run with scissors um, that even as an adult, I know uh, no, never run with scissors in your hand, but it's really not the most dangerous thing a person could do. Um, it's just, I've heard it so many times. So what you want is that when your kid is 13 or 14 and somebody says, hey, send me a nude photo, you don't want this to be the very first time they think about whether or not it's a good idea. You want them to instinctively say, oh, wait, no, I never send nude photos. My parents have been saying that to me since I was three years old. Um, and then the last non-negotiable uh, offense here is threats. This is like, this is not a practical joke. Um, talking on social media uh, or in messages about bombs or violence or weapons or threatening people is really bad. And if you do it on social media, it is something that you can go to jail for. So these are things that we should be uh, reiterating and making sure that our kids know. Um, and then in, in the middle here is uh, ASIJ policies. 
Um, first, and this is important, ASAJ does not require students to use um, social media accounts um, uh, as part of school. Like we use we use Google Chat and we use um, uh, we use the messaging on the iPads. But but uh, if your child says that they have to have a Twitter account because their humanities teacher gave them an assignment, or if they have to use Instagram in, in PE class, it's probably not true. Um, and that's especially not true if they're under 13 years old. Their their teachers know that they are not uh, uh, not that's not something that we do. Um, also, it's important to reiterate these um, the shutdown times here. When when we introduce messaging in the elementary school, the kids are taught about what time they have to um, shut down and stop messaging each other. Uh, we want everybody to know that if when you put your iPad in the family charging basket, you can sleep soundly and you're not gonna miss out on an important message from your friends or your teachers, uh, because if you're in this grade, this is the time that um, messaging stops. So it's important that we all reinforce those same grade level expectations. Um, and then speaking of 13, so this is the 13 years old rule. And this basically comes down to the terms of service of the social media company. Um, most social media companies collect private data about their users. And most of those companies are American. Um, and American law is restrictive about who is capable of agreeing to be able to disclose information. So when an 11 year old signs up for an Instagram account, they're not actually breaking the law. They're not violating American law. What they're doing is violating the terms and conditions of Instagram's agreement. Um, and, and so typically the way that they do it is to lie about their age, because this is pretty easy math. A nine year old can figure out what year they would have had to be born in if they want a computer to think that they're 14 years old. Now, the reason that this is a big uh, um, a problem, a challenge, a thing with a downside. Um, one reason is that companies have a special set of rules that they can enforce on people in between 13 and 18. And not, not all of them do, but some, um, some have settings that are designed to protect minors. Uh, so for example, maybe location data sharing is off by default, uh, or there might be an extra warning for people who are 16 about sharing information more publicly than you should. Instagram, as an example, uh, has some really good supervision settings that help parents mentor their teens' usage and also protect teens from unwanted messages from adults. But if your nine-year-old lies and says that they were born in 1970, then a few years down the road when they turn 13, they're not going to have any of those protections. Like They're going to have an adult version of the, of the app. Um, but the other reason is, if they say that they were born in 1970, that they are lying. Um, and so if you think that they're old enough and you think that and you agree as a family that they should be able to have a social media account, um, in order to make that account, they have to enter a fake date of birth. So if it's OK in your family for them to put in the fake date of birth, you really should be explicit about why it's OK to do it. Right, because you want them to say, uh, I you want to be able to say, like, I trust you, and so we are going to say this is your birthday. Um, what's eventually going to happen is that they are going to run across a pornography site, and it's going to have a thing on it that says, This is adult content, you have to be 18 to enter. And what you don't want them to say is, Oh, well, my mom told me it's always okay to lie to computers about your age when you're on the internet, so I can just put in, uh, yes. So, um yeah, so you really need to be explicit about why it's okay for them at their age uh, to have an account, even if the rule says 13 and over. Um, and now speaking of pornography and adult content, that is going to be our May uh, No Value Care session on media literacy and sexting and online pornography. And I hope that we see a lot of you in person at that session as well. Um, and before we close up today with some questions, um, I'm going to put the survey link into the chat. Uh, so I hope you can fill out the survey and let us know how we can improve for next time. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Nadine. Okay, so we've heard today about different aspects of social media. We've talked about what it is. So we've talked about passive versus active consumption of, of social media. We've talked about the algorithms and the idea that our behavior on social media is influenced by the social media platform itself. So what we'd like to do now is to invite you to put some questions into the chat. So what questions might you have about what we've discussed here today? 
What questions might you have that we haven't addressed today, but you would like to know more about? Or if you are a parent of a high schooler and there's some advice that you wish that you had received about dealing with social media with your middle schooler, please feel free to add that to the chat as well. And we can, uh, we can learn from one another um, about what has worked and what hasn't worked in our homes. So what questions do we have out there? And please use the chat function for this. Thank you, Chicky. Um, the question there, I'm not sure if everybody can see it, is how much social media consumption is too much on a daily basis? Um, well, I'll open that up to, to any of the other panelists as well. And I think that, that that's something for you to decide with your family about what you feel is appropriate um, at the different ages. Um, and uh, and I think that the answer to that can vary depending on age, depending on your individual child and their personality and what activities they're into and what, um, to go back to the passive versus active, what they're actually doing with the social media. Yeah, for our family, we had agreements um, around balance. And what we sort of said is instead of saying social media as one bucket, we made sort of like the active versus passive be the important factor. So for example, if, if you are playing a game and engaging with your friends, you know, through chat on the game, um, that's one area to have a balance in, which is different than sitting and watching YouTube. And we sort of made it clear with our kids that, you know, those are not equal tasks. And so we're not gonna make a, a bucket just for social media. We're gonna sort of say, let's talk about active things, active playing outside, active playing inside, active through uh, app usage and game usage versus passes, passive sitting around watching video. And so I think in the end, Nadine's right. You have to sort of decide what makes sense for your family, but for our family, what really helped was having that distinction helped us as parents sort of make those decisions because it's like, there's a difference between, you know, sitting on an iPad and just watching videos for three hours versus playing an hour game with friends and interacting with them on in that way. Yeah, I would say too, uh, that was more our, our primary, um, way about it when our kids were younger and it was things where they had an opportunity to act or interact like um, Roblox or Minecraft was the primary, you know, social media platform. But um, now that it's primarily, you know, Instagram and TikTok, um, actually, we just had this conversation in the last week. We were all, and that's my husband and I included, looking at our time spent, you know, in our in the screen time app on on i our iPhones, um, checking how much usage we'd had, and that's daily and weekly. And um, won't mention any names, but one of our family members had, I think it was crazy, like twelve hours or something that week um, on TikTok, and. Um, you know, without being judgmental, we're all just asking ourselves sort of why, uh, what were we feeling? We're kind of noticing that, you know, at the end of January, beginning of, of February, maybe some avoidance mechanisms are coming into play. Um, you know, we're tired from a long day and then maybe a, a practice, a sport practice, and then we come home and we're avoiding our homework or you know, we're just tired and we want to zone out, but what ends up happening is it really sucks us in. And before we know it, it's a vicious cycle of where we're using um, way too much time on that. And then that exacerbates, um, you know, our time issues because now we're doing homework later and then now we're getting less sleep and then now we want to zone out even more. Um, so again, this isn't just something our kids are struggling with it. You know, it's the adults in our household too. And we just continue talking about it and what we might do because of it. Um, this person did delete their TikTok um, and they decided on their own actually to give themselves a break from that. Um, a follow-up conversation will be, okay, well, how much time was spent on in Instagram reels and have you just replaced one with the other? But again, um, this person, and can come to the table in a non-judgmental way to think through it because we have a mentor relationship set up. 
Randy, I'm I'm glad that you brought up the the use of data there because, like, not only our our devices give us really good dashboards of what we're doing, um, but also we're not very good judges of that ourselves, right? Like when you're totally lost in the moment and you're on the couch and you're doing a thing that you really it's it's sucked you in you don't know whether that was five minutes or a half an hour. And um, and so to be able to say, um, uh, here's how I'm feeling. And I feel like I probably spent the right amount. Oh my gosh, 12 hours. And then you can kind of, okay, I, I need to do something about that. So having that conversation and being reflective and using the data to help drive that conversation, that is a, that is a, uh, a really good strategy. And that could be done with the younger kids too, with Minecraft, Roblox. Mm -hmm. You know, like Josh was saying, was that balance with your outside time? Um, again, for younger kids, it's going to be a little different approach. I'm not sure how old your children are, Jason. Yeah, and I just want to make sure that because both Warren and 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 uh, Randy mentioned this, but if you don't know, there's an app on all Apple devices called Screen Time, and that's where you can get this data. So if you don't already have that on for your your devices, look into it. Um, we have some help on our ES iPad website, but you can also do some searches online to find Apple's pages. It's really great because um, it's a good conversation starter that the temptation by some parents is to say, I'm going to go to screen time and I'm going to put up time limits on apps. We don't suggest that, but screen time produced the graphs that Randy and Warren were, were, were mentioning so that you can then help your child take a look at that graph and help them understand and make those decisions themselves, which uh, um, I'll give Randy a clap for having success with uh, you know her family and sort of using that um, but yeah yeah it's screen time is the app and and my recommendation is don't start blocking or turning time limits on start by just looking at the graphs that generate and and honestly um, that usually is enough you know and and I'll say for one of my my, my children because kids are different um, one of my children does struggle a little bit more with um, YouTube and so they actually looked at the graphs and said hey, I'm struggling and I'm not having a, a, a great time and I'm not able to put it down as well. Could you put a time limit on for me? And I said, well, let, yeah, if that is a tool you want to try yourself, let's do it. And, and then we can decide what time makes sense, how much time, and we can kind of revisit that later. So I think using the tools in that way is, is much more productive and sort of encourages that mentor approach. Yeah, again, it's back to um, that car analogy and that we want them to eventually be able to drive on their own safely. Thank you. Yes, um, my son, uh, one of his strategies is when he knows that he's really got to settle down and wants to focus, he will come and give me his phone um, because he doesn't trust himself not to not to to have it beside him and not be tempted to delve into um, the social media. And so he, you know, he will come and he'll, he'll, he'll just sort of give it to me. Um, and as a, as a, as a teacher, I used to say to my students, you know, you, your phones have a study mode on them. Um, and they would be uh, asking about what, well, no, it doesn't. I said, yeah, it does. It's a little airplane symbol. You press that and that's study mode. Um, and that's, you know, uh, just teaching them strategies that, uh, that help them. Are there any other questions um, that, and, or comments or suggestions or success stories that you would like to share um, that you want to pop into the chat? Um, yes, for teenagers, peer pressure is significant. And uh, I think that is very, very true. And it is important to have that open door um, with your child so that they will come and talk to you about it and it's about asking asking lots of questions um well i don't think everybody can see this comment so i'll i'll read it so um the person said i'd like the point about reiterating the important message and the, using the scissors example and for teenagers there's a lot of peer pressure and it's a big part of social interaction at school and so there's some important inter information around messaging reiterated at school, especially from the perspective of, of not going to the strict no from a social media practice and, and that they see some good practice at ASIJ and it seems that uh, these these are cultural. So that's a great, great comment. Thanks for sharing that. Um, great question. Thank you. Um, 
Did we mention the effects of social media on attention span? No, we did not touch on that. Um, any, of my, any of the other pal panelists want to talk about that? I, I can. I, I have read some research on this. And I think the most important thing I would say is, and this kind of goes back to a comment Warren made earlier, that we are not the best judges um, without looking at data. And so one of the things I think that, that assumptions are made that social media is bad for attention span. And what more research is showing, it's not so much social media per se, it's multitasking. And so this idea of that we are able to multitask is something we're finding out now through research that we aren't, as humans, able to multitask as well as we think we are. And so um, whenever you switch from one task to another, there's a ramp up time that your brain needs. And so if you're doing multiple things at once, uh, you have to kind of switch back and forth. And I think this is an issue that, that comes up more in high school as kids get more active on social media, but also get, you know, larger um, homework uh, loads as well. And we do see it in high school where uh, students will do things like do homework, but also maybe chat on the side or watching a video while they're doing homework. And, and one of the things that um, we do try to, you know, emphasize to them is that uh, if you take the time it took you to do your homework, if you were to do it just on its own, uh, it would be much shorter than interleaved with doing other things at the same time. And so um, I think that is one of the, the big uh, things that we, we like to uh, emphasize to students is that um, switching modes between thinking, um, it feels like as humans that we can do it and we're good at it. But if you actually look at the data and look at the time it takes you to do a task just focused on that versus doing it interleaved with other things, not only does it take longer because it's interleaved with other things, but even if you just add up that time, it will take you longer to complete that task. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Oh, you know, the research that I'm I'm going to share with you, I, I touched on it earlier, but I didn't get into the specifics. Um, it's really good research uh, about the effects of social media. It's not specifically on attention span. It's more on uh, depression. And um, and what the researchers did, uh, they used they took advantage of the natural experiment that Facebook was introduced at different college campuses at different times. And so they analyzed medical visits um, and uh, at the campus medical centers, uh, and they they were able to extract mental health medical visits and then look for correlation between uh, when Facebook was introduced at that college campus. And so they were able to find some really, um, really solid uh, um, effects, uh, especially on um, on depression. Um, and so I think it's 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 nice to see. Uh, the quality of the research that's coming out now that we have enough of a, of a data set of social media use. So this is a, an interesting art of, uh, a topic to stay on top of. If you read articles about this, try to make sure you find some that are rooted in research. There are a lot of articles out there that, that talk about things that are self-reported um, by people. And so things like that say like, oh, I feel like my attention span is less but they actually haven't done the research to find out if that is true or not. So I think like the links Warren is going to share is all um, research that is actually done by, you know, scientists and, and doctors and, and professionals. And um, I, I put a little more credence into those in, in, rather than the sort of pop articles that it's just like self-reported um, effects, which, which, as we know, humans are not the best at reporting accurately. Well, we're about out of time. So I'd just like to end by thanking you for joining our webinar today. Um, and we hope to see you at our next one, as Warren mentioned, which will be in person in May. So look out for, for information on that that will come your way. So thank you so much for joining us today.